podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson is a physicist, author, and the president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institution, which is the oldest technological university in America. Recently, she visited Elon University and spoke with Elon's president, Leo Lambert, about the importance of science education. Dr. Jackson, thank you for being with us here at Elon. I'm delighted. It's, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Describe the quiet crisis you have often referenced. The quiet crisis represents looming gaps in our science and technology capability because of looming gaps in our science and engineering workforce, really due to three things. The first is that a fairly large percentage of our current science and engineering workforce, U.S. citizens, are those who came of age in the post-Sputnik era and they have begun to retire and increasingly more of them will retire in the next five years. The second is that we have been the beneficiary of exquisite talent from abroad here in the U.S. and the immigrants have come and they've powered our industries, have created new enterprises. But now, while they still come, more of them go back home and many more of them have opportunity uh, where they come from, particularly in developing countries, in emerging economies that are growing very rapidly, such as China. And so we can't depend upon that uh, the way we could in the past. And the third is simply that our own young people, the coming generations, are not so well prepared, do not perform so well in science and math, and don't express the same degree of interest in science and engineering. What are the implications of the quiet crisis for American innovation and American security? Well, the simple answer is that innovation derives from people. And in the end, if we don't have the people who are making the discoveries, creating the innovations, the kinds of innovations we've depended upon and built our economy on for the last 50 years, we won't have the economic strength that we really need. And economic strength and innovation are keys to security as well. And one can look at it in a very technical way, but the important thing is simply to understand that we need a high performing uh, workforce, particularly in these fields, to secure our security, whether it is economically in terms of energy or homeland security and defense. Let's talk about energy security because you've been an eloquent spokesperson in this regard. Tell us how science and technology can help us realize more security and lessen our dependence on imported oil. Well, we talk about energy independence every now and then. I do not. I talk about energy security because in a global world with global trade, transportation, and multiple ways to access energy, one has to think about the security of the energy that we need to power our economy. So what has to happen in that regard? The first is to know that there's no silver bullet. There is no one source of energy that will solve all of our problems. That then means we need a portfolio approach. And in order for us to have a robust portfolio that protects us against shocks, whether they are shocks due to natural disasters, uh, geopolitical events, or for other reasons, we need innovation. Because if we're going to find new sources of energy, if they're extractive sources, we have to be able to do that in a more environmentally benign way, and these sources will be harder to find. If they are renewables, they certainly depend upon innovation, new materials, uh, new designs of uh, things from turbines, uh, new ways to uh, design and build buildings. Buildings use a lot of energy. The only way we're going to get there is through robust innovation across a broad range of fields because there's no one field that has the solution to everything. Therefore, we have to be able to think our way through prioritized and focused investment. 
Your institution, RPI, where you've been president for more than a decade, has been named as a national model of an environmentally conscious and responsible institution. Tell us what you're doing on those fronts. Well, what we're doing to be as environmentally conscious as we can be and to have as a sustainable campus are two things. One, with our existing infrastructure, and we've been around for a long time, and the current campus is over 100 years old, and we've done backfitting of technology to, in fact, uh, controlled energy uses. We've come up with uh, new ways to look at the usage patterns in buildings to be able to take uh, buildings and facilities offline so that we can channel our energy use. But in addition, we've looked at substitution, substitution of energy sources, recycling as well. We even use cooking oil in our golf carts to, that take people around our campus. And then when we build new facilities, we always go for the LEED certification. But beyond that, we actually try to take what we learn and discover ourselves in our laboratories and design studios and inculcate them into what we do to make our new facilities, as it were, beta test sites for new technologies. And then we've, of course, uh, had more emphasis on renewables more generally, including the use of wind turbines and other things. Are you optimistic for America that my, the America that my grandchildren will inherit? I am. I think we have to make certain hard decisions in the, uh, areas that relate to our economy, and uh, that relate to how we educate our young people, that relate to our investment and support of basic research. And if we do those, then I'm not worried. Why? Because our young people, our children and grandchildren, are wonderful, and they are very focused. You and I have the privilege of leading great institutions, and we see it every day with our students. And so if we hand to them a society, an economy, where we've made some hard decisions that we need to make, and it's a balanced portfolio in that regard, and we educate them the way we should, then we'll continue to be the greatest country on earth. President Shirley Ann Jackson, it's a privilege to have you in North Carolina today. Thank you for visiting us. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV.